Okay. Welcome everyone to uh, episode four of the Nuts and Bolts series and I'm very excited today to be joined by uh, Mr Christopher Gee who is a, a consultant trauma and orthopaedic surgeon with a specialist interest in uh, soft tissue knee and lower limb arthroplasty. Uh, he currently works in the Golden Jubilee Hospital in Glasgow and for NHS Lanarkshire and he's got a very strong interest in medical education throughout his training um, currently acting as um, honorary senior, senior clinical lecturer at the University of Glasgow and also the education lead for the West of Scotland Deanery. I thought we'll start with um, going back to the beginning. Um, so I want to cast your mind back, if that's OK. Um, and I yeah. want to start with the question I ask everyone, which is why orthopaedics and specifically has that answer changed throughout your training or where you are now? Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. Always happy to sort of share my experiences. Um, I think why orthopaedics certainly has changed um, and um, probably goes back even further than that in that initially... I was more interested in being a surgeon and actually even up until FY2 I was interested in being a colorectal surgeon and that really just came from my experiences at medical school and the people who mentored me um, who sort of showed me you know what surgery could be like and um, made me really enthusiastic for it and that was a group of colorectal surgeons in Aberdeen and um, so that's what I thought I, I wanted to do it was when I then did orthopedics as an F2 that I really discovered you know that a specialty that kind of fitted even more if you like and I felt really part of the fantastic team at Bristol Royal Infirmary had an amazing time just a great four months and thought you know what you know even though I was spending a significant amount of time on the wards doing the usual ward jobs you know the time on call the pathology the fractures everything else the manipulations all that kind of stuff I just absolutely loved it and um, that's really why I chose um, uh, orthopedics I don't think I really fully, to be honest, understood everything about what orthopedics meant at that stage. Um, but it was during my core surgical training that I got a better idea of that um, in terms of, you know, the planned um, essential type surgeries that we do, the joint replacements, etc., cetera, um, as well as the trauma, which is really what I'd had an experience of up until that point. Um, and really seeing, you know, what you can do for patients in terms of improving their quality of life. I think is something that you know I've grasped a better understanding of throughout training and now as a as a consultant that's the thing that I really find most rewarding is you, know, you take people who are you know essentially disabled you know with COVID some patients who are even wheelchair bound yeah. and you now are um, you know basically giving them the ability to walk to function again um, you know there are studies out there that show some of these conditions have a quality of life worse than death and you operate on them you do something technical with your hands you work in a friendly fun theater environment you slightly high pressure but you know rewarding in that respect and then at the end of the day if you've done the surgery well um the patients have a great outcome you know and that that's very rewarding and that's why i like orthopedics and i guess um orthopedics has got a reputation or did have a reputation at least in the past um, and did you kind of have that in your head before you went into orthopedics as, a, as an F2 or even later on? Um, well actually I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I probably didn't know that orthopedics had a, had a reputation if that makes sense and um, I, I just wasn't really clued into what orthopedics was about and it was, I would say it was very green as a, I remember my first night on call as an orthopedic SHO, as an FY2, just not really being 100% sure, you know, what I, what I needed to do. Um, but I had a very supportive team who understood that, you know, I was going to be hardworking, but had a lot to learn and um, made it a very rewarding experience. So um, I think that the whole thing around this um, reputation in orthopedics is quite um, damaging and, and it's, and it's a falsehood that's really kind of perpetuated, not necessarily by orthopedic surgeons, but by, you hear it from other, other specialties quite often. It's quite frustrating because there are definitely people out there who'd make fantastic orthopedic surgeons who would, would love to pursue it as a career, who have been told by other people, oh, you can't do it for this reason, you can't do it for that reason. Um, so, you know, just to nip that in the bud and, you know, make sure people know that Generally speaking, orthopedics is a very popular specialty full of very friendly people. And I think if you look at the comp competition ratios for um, training applications this year, the run through ST1 training in orthopedics had the highest competition ratio out of any specialty at any level. Um, so I think hopefully that you know, 
uh, is recognition of the fact that you know as a specialty that that um uh, that uh reputation we have is is gone i hope Absolutely. And I think it's really apt you're talking about um, training. So I think today in uh, England anyway, that the, the SD3 um, numbers have uh, been declared and come out. So, um, you know, that's that's more relevant than ever, I think. Well, there, um, were, there were two SD3 numbers in Scotland, actually. So um, some of my trainees were finding out today whether they did or um, didn't get get a number. So, um, you know, it's been used on, on both sides. And you know, it's very hard to hear people who, you know, would make fantastic colleagues Absolutely. You know, not quite making the, the grade this time and you know looking forward to trying to help them you know pick up and and um you know get there next time get over the line next time so. absolutely and i guess so thinking now that you're you're a registrar you're in the registrar training years um when did you start yeah. to decide on subspecialties is it quite an early thing a late thing and um, what drew you to what you're doing now so i trained in kent sorry sussex which has quite a structured training program where your st3 year you essentially just do trauma operating and then your st4 year you just do arthroplasty so hip and knee replacements um, and you do do that in the same unit for the for the two years um, unless things have changed but you know it's been a few years since i was there but um you know i did a fantastic st4 year um in uh chichester and work with some really inspiring um, surgeons, um, including my training program director and ex Exeter Hip Fellow Samantha Hook, um, and um, you know it was just fantastic. And I, I loved I loved replacing joints, and I loved what it meant to the patients. And I found the surgery really interesting. I found the outcomes great, um, and you know from a technical aspect, it had had everything. So um, really, I decided on joint replacement surgery at that point, and I thought that was. That was, you know, what I was going to do, and potentially a you know, revision surgery there as well. You know, maybe hip, maybe knee. Um, and then in my final two years of training, I worked in Ashford and St Peter's, which is a, again, another fantastic unit with a lot of um, history. You know, we've all heard of the Bristow um, periosteal elevator, and it's the Roly Bristow um, orthopedic unit. So, I think they've had a few other fairly famous surgeons through there in their time as well. Um, and there was a surgeon there called Paul Tricker who. Um, really showed me the light with soft tissue knee surgery and, and you know a different group of patients different aspirations expectations different set of problems that they have these are you know often younger sportier people um, or people who uh, work manually who've injured their knee and you know for them that could be you know a lot of aspects of their quality of life impacted whether it's you know high level sport or whether it's just being able to play with their families or being able to work um, and again, it's a satisfying surgery. It's keyhole surgery, which I always found I was fairly um, capable of doing. And um, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I enjoy the soft tissue sort of sports side of things now as well and have a kind of job that combines all of that. I think um, especially what you're saying about the early stages of in our rotation, West Midlands, again, we do trauma six miles from on arthroplasty. And that certainly rings true for me as well, that impact on the patients that you can visibly see, um, you know, as soon as a day after surgery, not even day after. Um, I think obviously you've mentioned a lot of positive parts about trauma and orthopedic training, but like every training program, there are challenges. So what would you say, especially during the registrar years and even after have been the challenges? Uh, well, there was one obviously very specific challenge during our training or my training, which was the junior doctors strikes and obviously the new junior doctors contract and all the sort of un uneasiness that that brought about. And that was obviously a very difficult time um, to be a trainee where you just don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, the initial proposals by the government looked dangerous, um, looked unfair wasn't very clear how people were going to be remunerated and you know that's obviously why there was you know widespread strikes you know on a scale not seen for a long time um so that was very challenging um from you know just i guess that's not something that's going to occur again however probably or hopefully um otherwise i'd say the the most challenging thing in orthopedic training is the fellowship of the royal college of surgeons exam the frcs um which basically, you know, you, you take in your ST7 year, maybe ST8 year for some people, um, and you spend nine months studying. And, you know, I was commuting 50 miles each way at the time. So I was sort of up before six o'clock in the morning, 
you know, working all day home, you know, just in time to, you know, say goodnight to my daughter and then, you know, spending two hours studying and repeat for nine months and then studying most weekends for some of the weekend as well. And, you know, you do, you do basically you lose a year of your life studying for that exam. Um, but I don't regret it at all. And um, uh, obviously you, you realize that you're learning a lot um, of important stuff through the process of studying for that exam. And it does really set you up for being a consultant. I think it's you know, a necessary evil um, that really prepares you um, and brings you up to a level kind of the, the next level, if you like, in terms of being ready to be a consultant. Um, and so, yeah, it's probably the hardest thing I'd say in training is the exam, but um, a worthwhile experience in terms of them being ready for the next steps. Yeah. And I guess you've, you've touched on it as well, um, that FRCS kind of concentrates that um, requirement on your time to not only work, but also study. But I guess mm -hmm. um, more generally throughout training, there have been, um, you know, a lot of people talking about having families and doing surgical training of any description and trauma and orthopedics is certainly included in that. How have you found, you know, having a family and also um, working um, full time as an orthopedic registrar and now consultant? Uh, well, there are times where, you know, it's it's a balance that's too much in favour of surgery. Um, and often you're at the, you know, beck and call of, you know, the way you're working and where you're being placed from a training point of view. You know, there may be other stuff going on in your life that's a challenge as well. And, you know, everyone has that. Um, but uh at the end of the day you know i have a career that is quite fulfilling and i enjoy that and you know i think that means that i bring that enjoyment home at the end of the day and hopefully that makes the time i have with my family better overall than if i was doing something that i didn't want to do just because i was worried about the impact on my family and then was was miserable all the time because i hadn't hadn't selected the career that i wanted to do and i think that there are lots of options out there available for people that will allow them to have the work-life balance that they want either during training or after training. And, you know, there are plenty of um, surgical trainees, uh, orthopedic trainees on mat leave who, you know, maybe it takes them a couple of years extra to get to the end of their training, but I don't think anyone, when one questions that, it's just a part of, part and parcel of it all now, nowadays. And, um, I don't think anyone wanting a family should be put off surgical training at all. Um, in fact, you know, we need more variety in surgery and in orthopedics and they should be, if it's what they want to do, they should absolutely be encouraged towards it. Absolutely. And uh, there's been a, you know, a great growth in women in surgery in general. I think trauma and orthopedics is certainly following that as well, which is, which is excellent. And um, I want to move on now to, so you've gone through your registrar training years and you're kind of on one side of the table going to ARCPs and, um, you know, trying to you know, get through training and perform well. And now you're a consultant, you've kind of reached the, the pinnacle of what you've been working several years for, if not longer, since the start of medical school. How has your views changed now that you're on the other side of the table, so to speak, um, you know, training trainees? Um, I mean, I always set out with the view that I'd be training trainees um, as soon as I became or as soon as possible after becoming a consultant. Um, I um, always set out to be a... Um, do you just want to ask that question again? My dishwasher is being really loud right now. <laughs> I don't um, know if no, sorry, me. I was just saying that now throughout training, I think a lot of registrars, um, you know, want to get through the ARCP, want to, you know, do one in their job. And they're kind of on one side of the table, um, whereas, of course, they're involved in training as well. But when you get to become a consultant, the expectation is that you're obviously training as well. Um, and you are kind of on the other side of the table. Uh, and I was wondering if that has changed your views on anything in particular, especially because you're very heavily involved in training. No, I think um, mostly it's, um, it, it, you know, it's just, it's quite heartwarming to see, you know, the trainees that are out there and seeing, you know, all the different aspects. Because when you're, when you're a trainee, you don't really know a lot about everyone around you. You're just doing your best. You're in your, you're almost in a silo. You don't see anyone else's portfolios. You don't know what other people's um, multi-source feedbacks like. You don't know what work-based assessments they're doing, what consultants are writing and saying to them about their skills and abilities. And you know, you're just relying on your supervisors telling you, you know, you're doing a good job. Um, 
and so when you then are on the other side and you see all these really interesting things about all the different people in your rotation and you know what that brings to the table i think it's actually just you know really rewarding um one of the things that i hadn't fully anticipated is you know i quite enjoy some obviously operating and having to you know, or having to but you know choosing to give away those operations to a trainee when you're secretly kind of thinking oh, I'd quite like to do this operation um sometimes you know um uh, can have an impact but at the end of the day it's really rewarding to see a happy trainee at the end of an operation having done a done a good job and knowing that you've helped take them through that process and you know I think training is an integral part of a, being a surgeon um and uh we should all be um training as best as possible really okay and how, how did your um interest develop in medical education i mean did you do any formal qualifications was it just ad hoc teaching so it started off um i remember having you know like i kind of touched on those mentors in colorectal surgery in aberdeen really kind of you know teaching me and um, obviously was enthusiastic for surgery to start off with but you know um, showing showing me what I could do and get me closing wounds and you know getting me interested and involved I thought well this is this is fantastic um, and then you know on, on the on the other side you have the people who you know aren't interested in teaching you almost send you away for the day which sadly does happen you know regardless of the specialty in in medical school sometimes I still hear those stories from medical students from time to time and um, you, know, you see about it on Twitter as well, for example. But um, I guess that made me think that, you know, I want to be the, the, the consultant that inspires people towards, you know, a career in surgery or, you know, they come away at the end of the day thinking, yeah, that, you know, I really learned something today. I had a really good time, you know, rather than going away thinking, you know, I don't really, I'm not interested. I didn't like that guy. I didn't, didn't have a good time. Um, and then, so I kind of said at that point, I want to be a good teacher and that's going to be an important part of who I'm going to be as a doctor. And I just kind of took the opportunities as they came along. So in Bristol as an F2, I ran a course um, which was part of the shadowing program in, in Bristol, which wasn't um, nationwide at the time, but they did some audits that looked at a number of kind of clinical incidents shortly after new FY1s had started before and after they introduced the shadowing program. Um, and basically the results from that project, which I was a very small part of, um, brought about, you know, that national paid shadowing period of time that people now get to, to have before they start as a doctor. And so seeing how education can have such a big impact on, you know, across the board really kind of just spurred me on to do more. And it's kind of just snowballed from there. Um, and I've just tried to make the most of the opportunities out there. You know, like you say, I'm an ATLS instructor. I've instructed on CRISP. I've instructed on um, basic surgical skills. Um, and, um, and then obviously with uh, working with Zishan Qureshi and the Unofficial Guide to Medicine was able to get involved in education through writing um, uh, textbooks. And again, that's really rewarding working with medical students who are, who are helping edit and write the books and, you know, making sure the content is relevant and seeing the benefits of that and the feedback that you then get um, from the books, you know, it's, it's just all very rewarding. So no, I haven't got a formal qualification in teaching really as such. I've done a, the courses that you'd expect, um, but no um, postgraduate diploma or, or otherwise. It's just, it's just from experience. I think that's really, really refreshing as well, because I think a lot of people think they have to do a postgraduate certificate or have to have a master's to, you know, um, be, become involved in teaching but as you've um, rightly demonstrated that that's certainly not required at all um, I think I want to move on now to um, people who are interested in orthopedics um, either pre-registrar or even registrar level what can they expect when they reach consultancy what's a typical day or week like for for yourself okay so I'll, I'll give you an idea of a typical week um, based on you know my job plan at the moment so Monday morning is a is a fracture clinic, so I'd arrive um, at half eight for the virtual fracture clinic, and I'll maybe review twenty re referrals through to the virtual fracture clinic from A and E, um, and uh, make a plan for all of those patients. Um, my registrar will be in the room next door, and he'll be um, uh, kind of starting seeing the first few patients that are in the actual fracture clinic, and then once yeah. I've gone through the virtual fracture clinic, I'll then 
kind of pick things up and do the, the rest of the fracture clinic. Um, in the afternoon, I have an acute knee clinic. Um, so it's meant to be sports knee injury patients. We've got, you know, MRI slots we have early access to. We have physios on site. There's two consultants. Um, and that obviously, you know, provides that some of that subspecialty interest. My Tuesday and Wednesday are kind of fairly flexible days in terms of admin um, and um, what we call SPA, supporting professional activity time. And that allows me um, to work on, you know, different projects that I've got in the pipeline. So at the Jubilee, we're looking to set up meniscal transplant um, and um, an outpatient arth needle arthroscopy service. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's the usual stuff that you have to deal with as a consultant. Otherwise, you know, signing off your letters, dealing with queries from patients, planning your theatre lists, making sure the equipment's all there. Um, but if you're pretty organized that time, you can you can get a lot of it done pretty quickly. And while you might have some meetings, you know, you, you have some flexibility in that time as well. Um, and some of it's meant to be time kind of off because of the trauma commitment, um, which then means you, know, you have potential to you know, do something during the week, which is quite nice. Uh, Thursday is an all day elective clinic at the Jubilee. Um, so seeing patients with hip and knee problems, um, listing them for theatre. And then Friday is my um, set theatre day uh, where I'll, you know, potentially do four cases. Um, and that may be, you know, my next list. I have two Mako um, robotic knee replacements and ACL reconstruction and just a normal, you know, standard knee replacement, I should say. Um, so it's a fairly full on day. Um, we're very lucky at the Jubilee in terms of being able to get so many cases um, through. It's you know, a fantastic setup and I'm you know, privileged to be able to work there. Awesome. So it's quite a varied week with um, more general trauma equipment and also your subspecialty interests, as you've alluded to, with time built in for yourself to um, sort of pursue other um, interests and projects as well. So it's quite a varied role, not just being, um, you know, a, a trauma surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon where you're just doing clinics day, day in, day out, which are, you know, some people have the, the belief that that is, but that's obviously not true. Um, so... That's how your working life was like, I presume, pre-COVID. And we've kind of got through a lot of the interview without mentioning it, but I think we have to mention COVID now. How has that impacted your work as a consultant? The first wave, obviously, um, you know, we stopped all planned essential surgeries, so no hips, no knees, um, and just focused on the trauma that there was, but also spending a lot of time away from um, hospitals like every other person because you know we didn't want to end up being one of the number in the hospital with covid as much as you know anyone else so um there was a lot of working virtually you know making plans for patients who had been due to be seen in clinic um and uh speaking to patients over the phone and um trying to work out how we were going to manage not being able to do what we would normally do and um then there was a period of time where obviously the registrar teaching had stopped um, and uh, that's where I basically took up the educational role in the west of Scotland. Um, obviously the TPD was, uh, was very busy with um, managing all the trainees and everything COVID was impacting, um, which made it very difficult for them to then organise you know, a completely different structure for teaching. Um, and at the same time, I was kind of chapping in on the door saying, look, you know, I can do a, an online teaching session for them. I was doing online teaching with the unofficial guide um, with Smile, which was a sort of thing called sustaining medical, uh, I can't remember, sustaining medical education, a lockdown environment or something. I can't remember. Um, uh, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't work out. It's, it's, it's got a nice ring to it though, so. <laughs> I can't remember what the I is for. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so I was doing all these lectures online um, and then took over sort of running the, the, the deanery teaching um, and facilitating that on Zoom for uh, a lot of the kind of end of lockdown. Um, and that's, yeah, I've just carried on that role now. So that's great. So I basically run deanery teaching um, which doesn't mean giving all the lectures, it just means, you know, sort of facilitating the different subspecialties. So we've had a basic science term, um, we've had a trauma term, um, and now we're working through our tumour and peds term, um, and then it will be foot and ankle and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, that's been great because I got to meet many of the consultants in the region. You know, I'm here in the west of Scotland, but I didn't train here. And... Um, uh, and so we're getting to meet a lot of the consultants has been very rewarding. Um, 
and also a lot of the trainees, obviously, and there's someone interested in training, being able to get them and wanting to teach them is, is yeah, a big advantage as well. So that was really the first bit. And then um, I worked a lot with the Jubilee in terms of their restart plan. Um, because once it was clear that the Golden Jubilee is a funny hospital, so it was a private hospital um, actually owned by, I think it was Saudis, um, and their plan was they would fly patients in for you know, high high level care, and then they'd stay in the hotel that's attached. There's a four star hotel attached to the hospital, and then um, they would leave once they'd had their treatment, but it didn't really work. So it's ended up under the kind of management of NHS Scotland, and it has no A and E, so no medical wards, so no um, acute admissions really. Um, but it does, you know, cardiac and lung transplant uh, surgery and cardiothoracic surgery and um, uh, orthopedics and eyes and it's kind of expanded to do more cancer surgery as well during the COVID period but because once we realized we weren't going to need to have lots of COVID patients in the Golden Jubilee um, we worked on a restart plan to create a very green pathway which would allow us to then keep going and then you know during the summer that then increased um, and we started simple day surgery and started then with joint replacements. And then actually as this sort of second wave came in in October, November, December, and obviously into January, you know, the volume of joint replacements that we were doing was going up with almost, you know, the graphs were almost parallel between the, the, what we were doing surgically and the number of COVID cases. And we were obviously auditing all of the results very carefully. Um, uh, but with the pathways working, you know, we were able to continue even through all of January doing four joint lists, et cetera, um, and able to provide that care for patients, which has been, which has been fantastic. So um, I guess that's, that's the biggest difference in that the, the biggest challenge is really, you don't have any leave, you know, you take your annual leave, but you're not really going anywhere. So you don't get that same respite. Mm. Um, and, and so trying to maintain that balance has been tricky. And every aspect of the care is just a little bit more difficult because of COVID. You've got to think about the COVID tests. You've got to think about you know, your patient isolating. You've got to think about yourself and your actual flow tests and making sure you, you yourself don't get COVID because obviously that can have an impact on your patient care. Absolutely. And it, it's just, you know, we're just living with it now. Um, it's just frustrating. But, but yeah, that's how COVID's really impacted things. So, that's you know, it. some positives there, really. Um, but... Uh, so would you say you're back up to um, pre-COVID levels of operating or still not quite there yet? Uh, not quite there yet. Um, partly due to some you know, staff sickness, um, some um, issues with providing support to others, you know, to cancer surgery, for example, which does take a little bit of our capacity, I understand. Um, but we're really not far off it. And I think... I think the numbers around two and a half thousand surgeries since July that we've done in orthopedics at the Jubilee um, without uh, a patient being contracting COVID in the hospital, being unwell with COVID in the hospital in our department. So I think it's been really rewarding to see that you put the work in designing the pathways, you, know, you, you use the best evidence that's available to you and it, and it, it seems, to, seems to work. So um, I think there's there's absolutely right. There's a lot of parallels. I know certainly in our department, what you've described there could, could well apply to our department, department as well. That's exactly what's happened. Um, so um, it sounds like that's been happening throughout the country as well, which is which is good news. We're getting back up to you know where we were before. I think on a brighter note, um, for those people who are interested in orthopedics, either pre-register or even registrars, what what can they do to um, you know succeed in orthopedics, given your experience that you've had. So um, I think the best thing, best single piece of advice I can say is just to get involved and you know, get that get out there and get working. And you know, none of the stuff that's happened has you know I've particularly gone out of my way to make happen. But I was always looking for the opportunities, and there are tons of opportunities out there. Whether you're interested in teaching, research, you know, but if you don't look for the opportunities, then you know they're not going to present themselves to you. So, you know, if you're, if you're going around asking the consultants, you know, I'm really interested in teaching, how can I get involved in that? You know, I'm really interested in research. Have you got any projects that I can take on? You know, like I said, just putting yourself out there and showing that enthusiasm. And to be honest, the rest will just follow. Um, and um, I don't think that you can really give a 
you know advice on you know what each person person should do because each person's an individual but you know however you want to play the game and get yourself you know involved that's what you should be doing so don't sit back and expect expect it all just to happen um the more you put in certainly the more you'll you'll get out absolutely and i, I think um one thing i would want to put to you it's quite an interesting question is um from when you became a doctor to now, is there anything you wish you would have done or anything you would have done differently? So I guess the only thing I ever think about is, you know, should I or would I have considered taking time out at various stages? You know, I've gone F1, F2, CT1, CT2, ST3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, 10 months as a fellow and then consultant. And I've never had a, you know, a time abroad a year in New Zealand, Australia, you know, I've never had an F3 year doing something else. And so I've kind of had to fit in the things that I've been doing along the way. So I did a part-time MSC from F1 to CT1, just on top of my usual workload. Um, whereas I, I know a lot of people are spending a bit more time kind of taking that opportunity. But, but that being said, if I'd taken that time, then maybe I wouldn't be where I am now and I'd be looking for a consultant job in the middle of a pandemic. So... Mm. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure really that that uh, that's the case. But I do sometimes think back and think, oh, maybe it'd be nice to do a fellowship in New Zealand, or it'd be nice to do to go abroad. But but mostly, I don't really regret uh, anything. To be honest. Great. I think the, the MSc you're talking about is is that the Edinburgh Surgical Sciences one. I, I did yeah. that a few years ago as well, and it, it was uh, it was quite interesting actually, and um, quite eye opening as well. And got to go to Edinburgh as well, so a good little plug yeah, for that if you want to do that. I was the second year to do it, do it, and at the time they were doing a, a deal where if you, I think the fees were quite a lot less then than they are now, but also they paid for one attempt at the first part of your MRCS with the first year of your fees. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. And so, so I, I actually started doing the MSc in my FY1 year thinking, well, this will get me through it, you know, get me up to speed with what I need to know for MRCS because I, w I wasn't, you know, the highest flying medical student, you know, I was very much uh, middle, middle of the road when it came to my exam results. So, you know, I felt like I needed something to help get me up to, up to the level of knowledge I required to be competitive. Um, but then, you know, I realized I'd enrolled in an MSc program and if I carried it on, that would be really advantageous. Um, and um, yeah, I don't regret it at all. And yeah, I still go um, to uh, Edinburgh on a regular basis to enjoy going to the college. There's a coffee shop just down from, from the college in Edinburgh called Black Medicine Coffee Company. I yeah, sadly, I even know, I sadly, I, I sadly own a t-shirt from the Black, Black Medicine oh, Coffee really? Company. So, um, but yeah, so I, I love doing that MSc. It's really good. And um, I would recommend it to uh, anyone who thinks it might be for them. Yeah, absolutely. Edinburgh's a fantastic place. And there's, uh, there's a museum as well on site as well, which is well worth a visit. Um, I, I guess going forward now and thinking ahead, um, how do you see orthopedics changing in the future? Uh, so I suspect the biggest thing probably is going to be technology. Um, and that doesn't just mean robotics, although obviously I have a big interest in um, robotic surgery and we we're very lucky to have, um, well, we now have two uh, Makos at the Jubilee. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's a, you know, a huge number of robotic surgeries that we can perform. Um, and I, I already see the benefits with that in terms of planning your surgeries um, and, you know, just being able to optimize your implant positioning and, um, potentially excluding those you know, outliers, those patients that need a revision at an earlier stage because you know, something wasn't quite perfect in the operation. Um, and you know, what the robotics can do is fantastic, but there's lots of ways that technology can influence what we do in orthopedics. You know, technology to better understand you know, fracture healing. Um, AO have a device that you can put on a plate that measures micromotion which can potentially reliably tell you whether you know, a, a fracture that you've plated is going to go on to unite or not as early as sort of two to four weeks. So rather than waiting six months to see if the fracture is going to heal, you can pop this device on and you'll know within a month whether what you've done is, is going to do the job or whether you need to fix it earlier. So potentially 
that patient won't have six months of disability and pain waiting to see whether the bone will throw off callus or not. And you know, other things that I've seen shoulder replacements being done using augmented reality and glasses. Um, and, you know, the, the opportunity for using technology from an educational point of view, whether that be virtual reality um, or using it in theatre to you know, film you know, your, what you're doing surgically so that people who can't be in theatre can still see what you're doing. Um, and then using technology and, you know, obviously science to then understand um, patient outcomes and to um, improve our patient outcomes when you know, it's difficult because a lot of the surgeries we do, the patient outcomes are already pretty good. So trying to optimize those outcomes can be difficult. And I think, again, technology will, will play a role there. Right, no, absolutely. Um, so sort of final comments now, um, anything that sticks out in your training, if you had to pick one highlight, um, from becoming a doctor till now, what would it be? Gosh. <laughs> um, I still, I still remember getting my number very clearly, and I think that's probably topical today, um, because I knew that that meant that I'd been given something that would get me to CCT, it would get me to where I wanted to be, um, and you know, I, I still remember you know, reading it, reading the email in the middle of a ward round. Um, it was it was at a time where the applications were still regional. So it was before it moved to national applications. So I'd been interviewed by people I knew or, you know, people who knew of me. Um, and I suspect that everyone in the, in the region knew who was going to get their number. They just had to be quiet for two weeks whilst we sat there sweating, waiting to, waiting to get the email. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that have, knowing that that's it, you know, that the people in your region or the people in, you know, I guess now the UK have said, yeah, this person, you know, we want to give them a number. We want to train them to be a consultant colleague um, because that's what, you know, that's what we want. I mean, that's just a phenomenal feeling. That is when I really felt like, yeah, OK, I'm going to get what I want out of life with this from a career point of view. Fantastic. I think it's especially topical today. Um, listen, I don't want to take up too much of your time. This has been absolutely fantastic. I've certainly enjoyed um, hearing about, you know, your reflections and, and your training pathway and, and your thoughts. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you to you um, for giving up your time. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to find this useful. Um, what I want to say to everyone watching is, um, if you want to catch the full interview, please check out my YouTube, OrthoBuzz, or Instagram, Ortho.Buzz, or Twitter as well um, for the full interview. Um, but it just leaves me to say thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yee. Any, any final comments you want to say? No, no I hope you in, enjoy um, listening to me prattle on about orthopedics. And um, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you want to hear more from me or, or chat to me on getting in contact, then you, know, you can find me again on, on Twitter or Instagram. It's at Chris G. Ortho. Um, and more than happy to, for people to make contact with me through that. No problem at all. So... Um, yeah, like I said, get involved. Uh, orthopedics is a wonderful specialty. You know, it doesn't have some of the same stresses of some of the other specialties in terms of you know, dealing with immediately life-threatening problems, but certainly you can make a huge difference to people's lives. And um, I would recommend it if you're thinking about it. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And I'd echo that as well. Um, thank you very much. Have a good rest of the evening. Bye.